Well, good evening, everyone. We got a packed house tonight, so come on in, and get yourself seated. We got plenty, of, plenty of seats here up front. Come on in. Make sure you get your coffee and your and your bread. All right, boy. Boy, you guys are really good tonight. I start talking, everybody got quiet all of a sudden. Wow. I must be looking really mean tonight. All right, don't mean to. All right, it's good to have you here. All right, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Edia to get us started in prayer. Edia? Shall we stand to honor God? Oh, God, I help in ages past our hope for years to come. A shelter in the stormy blast and our eternal home before the hills in order stood or earth received her frame from everlasting thou art God through endless age the same and you will be forever and we thank you that you never change. You did everything for us. You took the little bits of clay, the dust of the earth, and made us. And you made us perfect. And we thank you. You gave us a task in the beginning. You told us to take care of the earth. And you told us to take care and replenish each other. And so tonight, we come to restate what we know to be is our original purpose. And going toward our original purpose is what we are here at CNM to do. All these people who help us are going toward one thing, one thing, to be exactly the vessel that you want us to be from the foundation of the world. You invented us and you sent us with a purpose. Thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. Thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you so much for putting in us the gifts, the skills and the talents that you gave us from the beginning. What we want to do is never let you down. We never want to get out of our own track. We never want to get out of what it is you have sent us to do. Show us again our purpose. Show us again where we ought to be. Show us again and teach us carefully exactly what it is you have sent us to do. And if you remind us of it tonight, we will give you praise. We'll give you honor and we'll give you glory and be glad to do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Edia. Well, are we fired up now? Is everybody, is everybody ready for a, a great presentation tonight? Because you will get one and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But we're going to do our... Our usual start off uh, tonight, so first off, we always like to have uh, celebrate uh, transitional intermediary steps in people's search. So those of you that have actually had a in-person interview, would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause? So if you've had an in-person interview over the last week, would you please stand up so we can 
Great. All right, we're going to add to your ranks. So if you're standing, keep standing. Those of you that have had a phone interview over the past week, would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. Keep standing. We're going to add to your ranks. So those of you that have at least met one other person this past week that you think is going to help you with your job search, maybe you've connected with them on LinkedIn, uh, met them at a networking event, uh, had a great phone conversation, would you please stand up so we can congratulate you on your networking activities? All right. And what do we say to everybody else who's still sitting down? Get to work. All right. Great. Uh, now, there is one other group that, especially when we have a packed house like this tonight, and uh, it can feel intimidating because we've got uh, lots of breakout sessions and people running around doing all kinds of things and talking to each other. Uh, those of you that have the famous red border around your name tag, it lets us know that you're first timers here tonight. So since you've braved the world to get here and you're going to be with us tonight, would you please stand up so we can give you a warm welcome? So red taggers, please stand up so we can give you a welcome. Great. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Nice, small, intimate group, right? All right, terrific. Well, uh, we have some job announcements, and I'm going to give a couple, to, couple of them to you right now. We always appreciate when alumni, uh, friends of CNM, forward uh, job uh, opportunities on to us. Uh, please make sure you check uh, our discussion section in our LinkedIn group, because that's where we always encourage people that have job opportunities to post them there. But uh, just so you have a quick feel of two that I have in my hand, and I'm going to give them over to Tom because he's going to grab them out of my hand and make sure they're up on the networking board next week. We have one that is a commercial flooring solutions account manager. I think it's a, um, a California group, and they're looking for a sales business development manager in the D.C. area. Compensation looks pretty nice. So if you're interested in that, it uh, looks like, um, I'm not exactly sure the name, it is Millicare. So... Uh, that's one opportunity, and that will be um, up on the networking board. Another that I have up here is a senior domestic policy analyst. Uh, Bread for the world, some of you know our volunteer, John Brown. I guess they keep on hiring at his organization. So, uh, again, it's a senior domestic policy analyst. So, it's, again, what's nice about these opportunities <clears throat> is that uh, both of these people are willing to be conduits to help get your resumes into the right people. So... And then also Denise is here. Denise, where's Denise? Denise, I want to come up and tell us about, Denise has a, a staffing firm and an opportunity that she'll explain to the group. So thanks for being here, Denise. I am put on the spot. Good evening, everyone. How are you today? Good. I'm Denise with New Covenant Staffing, and I have an immediate need for a software computer programmer. Um, heavy coding, um, .NET, SQL Server, Really, really heavy coding, um, about five years, so not, you know, intermediate. And uh, the position is in Maryland. So if anyone is interested or knows anyone, definitely reach out to me. I'm going to stand in the back and hope that someone comes and talk to me. Okay? Thank you so much. You have a good evening. Thank you, Denise. And Denise, you're going to get your posting on the LinkedIn group as well? Yes. Great. Okay, no, that's a great. We just, just want to make sure that you can also find it there. And um, all right, so the other, the, the best part of the evening other than John Venable's presentation, and you'll realize that pretty soon here by the end of the night, uh, is we actually have two victory laps tonight. And, I, uh, and those of you, thank you, thank you, William. <laughs> A victory lap for those of you that are first timers, when you finally land, when you finally get that opportunity. And by the way, uh, just in case you're always wondering, victory laps don't necessarily have to be the full-time job you're going to be in for the rest of your life. They can be a contract opportunity that you land. If you're, when you're in transition, sometimes we have people that do consulting work for short periods of time. We're happy to celebrate whatever you feel is a victory for yourself in your job search. So uh, we've already done the interviewing piece, but we're happy when people actually land a, a, a full-time opportunity. And I'd like to have Donald come up if you'd like to uh, be the first one to share. He's taking a quick swig. So he... I could tell something was going on with Donald tonight. I look over at him. He's got this big, you know, I can't say the word, but this big smile on his face, right? You know where I'm going with that. He's got this big smile on his face. He's always a positive guy. Whenever I see him here, he's always got this big, big smile on his face like he just ate the, ate the mouse or the cat that ate the mouse. But today he's got something really special to share with us. So, Donald, you got the floor. 
Thank you, ma'am. My name is Donald Hughes, and I'm delighted to be here and share with you. Just as a quick backdrop to my victory lap, let me just share with you, there's a great Bible story about Abraham and Sarah, and they were well up in age, 90 and 100 years old, and God comes to them after they've been um, a childless all their lives, and he comes and he says that, I'm going to bless you with a son, and they both were incredulous about this, and I love the words that God used. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is anything too difficult? That's the backdrop. I got laid off of a contract with Lockheed Martin way back in January, and it's been a really tough time for me. I've been here many uh, Tuesday nights, and uh, you know there were times when I just wanted to throw the towel in and just give up. In fact, things got so bad financially that back in July, um, I actually took a job with a construction company running bulldozers. Now, I went to a friend of mine, and I said, can you picture me riding a bulldozer? She said, sure, Donald, in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I've been doing for the last two months. Last Friday, I was on a bulldozer in Northeast D.C. Here's what happened. I got a job with, uh, when I first got a security clearance back in 2009, I went to work, and I was living in Maryland, went to work for Booz Allen Hamilton, big firm. Worked for them for a little bit more than two years, left them because I got an opportunity to come to Virginia at the Pentagon and worked at the Pentagon for a while. I want to make a long story short, um, I, I ended up working with Lockheed Martin, and as I said, that ended in this past January, and it's been a rough go. But then, here's something that I typically wouldn't do. I went to a job fair, and I know that you don't get a lot of responses from job fairs, but Booz Allen was there. So I talked to Booz Allen, told him that I was you know, a former uh, employee, and uh, didn't put a lot of stock into it. To make a long story short, I got an interview. And they said that the government customer wants to interview you. And they gave me the location for the interview. No joke. It was the same agency here in Virginia, the same building on the same floor that I worked for with Lockheed Martin. Today was my second day with Booz Allen Hamilton. Now, is anything too difficult for the Lord? There's no way I could have orchestrated this. When I went in for that interview, they took me to this little small room, same building I worked in, right? And there's two government people there, and I knew both of them. And they knew me. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? There's no way I could have orchestrated that. So I'm delighted to be here. And you know what? If you're out there thinking, well, you know what, God's forgotten about me, you know, um, this, I could never have any good fortune, guess what? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? You know what, I got one saying I'm going to leave you with. This is a Donald Hughes saying, build the ark and God will fill it. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. Well, uh if you want to come up and touch Donald, just in case he's got the good mojo going on, and maybe that'll uh, sprinkle over to you, then uh, you know he's got a suit on, so he's a little bit protected. But come on up and and uh, and network with Donald. It sounds like he knows what he's doing. Congratulations, that's great news. Uh, Maria, where's Maria? We have another victory lap. Maria, come on up. I understand, Maria, you're actually leaving. You're tr you're you're packing up to head somewhere to your next opportunity. Is that right? All right, we got to hear this story. Here's Maria. You know, it's really quite emotional to be here tonight. Two years ago, I was teaching, and my contract came to an end, so I came here actually to begin to look, and I looked on the Internet to see what possibilities were here. I'm actually from California and wasn't out here for a long time. So as I began to look, I came across the Career Network Ministry when I looked at McLean, actually, and... You know, it was really interesting. I got work right away, so I didn't come back for a whole year. And when that position ended, I really began in earnest. And one of the things that made a big difference to me is the very first night that I was here, and maybe this is because I'm a teacher, I really do read the instructions, <laughs> and I went through every table and the Career Network Ministry workbook that they give you, I actually began on the introduction and read through it. 
And what was very impressive to me was that it said, there's the world's way of looking for work, and then there's God's way of looking for work. And it said to pray. And I really did begin to pray. I never dreamed where the journey would take me because it's been 16 months, longer than I ever thought. And I was looking through notebooks at all the interviews, all the resumes that have gone on, but I never really got discouraged. I kept going out. I didn't, I'm didn't. i not going to say there weren't a couple of times that after an interview and I thought I had it, and then I didn't, that I didn't go to my car and sit down and cry. I did. Because I even called a friend and I said, you know, I feel like just having a good cry. I thought I had it. And she said to me, Maria, it's okay. You can have a big cry, but after the big cry, have a bowl of ice cream. <laughs> and so, you know, those are the kinds of friends that I had. So anyway, I was in Southern California looking for work. One of my friends and I were going to a conference. Her Bluetooth went off. She didn't know who it was. It was a pastor of a very big church. And she said, Maria and I are on our way to the N.T. Wright conference. And he says, is that that woman from the East Coast? And she says, yeah, that's her. And he says, bring her by. I'd like to say hi to her. I was dressed in California in capris and just very casual clothes. Both of us go in, and it turns out to be a full-blown interview. And after that interview, I got another job offer when I was here. So I had two job offers, and I actually took the one here and said no to the one that was 100% guaranteed to start on August 1st. I came back, and this one did not work out. So now I had lost both of them. So I got on, I, when, once the tears were gone, I put on the best voice I could and I called up California again. And I said, by the way, I'm interested in the position again. And they said, you are? I said, yes. Miraculously enough, that night they were meeting and they added my name. And they were honest enough to tell me there were two other people they were excited about. Oh, so then, on Wednesday, they emailed me and said, we are going to meet on Thursday and make a decision on Thursday. At midnight our time, I got the email that said, Maria, we extended the offer to you again. And so anyway, I accepted. I accepted the offer, and I, it's all done. I'm flying out on Thursday, and um, then I'll be back to do with the movers and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I want to encourage you, don't ever give up. Because coming to McLean, I'm not of McLean Church. I'm not of the denomination. And to tell you the truth, Mel, it was a little difficult because what I do is I actually teach seminary, you know. I have a doctorate in theology. And so, you know, I, know, I knew that wasn't congruent, but at the same time, it didn't discourage me because I thought, you know, God's purposes, like you said, are God's purposes. And so don't ever give up. You never know. And I even said no to one job, and still God's purpose was for me for that one position. So here I am. I'm leaving on Thursday. Thank you for everything. Thank you. What's the position? All right. Not, not congruent with McLean either. I will be an associate pastor for discipleship at the flagship church in Southern California of Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. Can I get a hug? I get goosebumps when I hear these kind of stories. That's just great, Maria. Well, well, can, we wish you a wonderful congratulations and a safe trip, and I hope the journey goes well, and, and California is all you want it to be, including the, the new opportunity. So I was getting goosebumps hearing that story. I don't know about you guys, but all right. Well, so that's we want to hear all that kind of good news from all of you. So the way that's going to happen is for you to be able to be prepared to best present yourself to someone that you might meet for only just a few seconds so that they know why they want to have a continued conversation with you. And uh, John Venable, we affectionately know him as JV, uh, is going to do an amazing presentation tonight. He's going to tell you more about yourself than, than I would ever tell you, and he's going to do a much better job about it. But uh, we really are very uh, privileged and honored to have JV here. Uh, former uh, Air Force pilot, and interesting enough, a former commander of uh, the Thunderbirds, so not the kind of folks that you typically see wandering into a career support group. So we're 
honored and privileged to have him here. And on that, I will turn the floor over to JV for an amazing presentation tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, tonight we're going to do a couple of things. First, I'm going to take everything out of my pockets because when I fall down, it generally hurts. I, I, I do that a couple of times a presentation. Um, we're going to do a couple of things tonight, and uh, I, I kind of want to start out a little odd. Um, if you have, I, this is my fourth year. In two weeks, I will be here uh, for a total of four years. I love this place. <laughs> And uh, I thank you. And, and that's, that's, that's not bragging. It's a place where I come in and I plug into. And you guys give me energy every week. I steal it like uh, there's no tomorrow. I hope you don't mind me borrowing it because it's more permanent than not. Tonight, I hope to give you a little bit of that energy back. But if you've been here longer than four years, would you stand up right now? How about that? We've got the, uh, the volunteers in the back, Bob and Dave and Mal and the likes, John, who've been here longer, obviously, but they were cheating and they were standing up. So if you don't mind, would you stand up again the four years? If you've been here for three years, would you mind standing up? Everybody who's been here longer than three years. Will, thank you. How about two years? Two years. Everybody, if you have been here for four years or three years or two years, please stand up if you don't mind. How about that? It's good to see you, Doug. Okay. One year. If you've been coming here for one year, would you stand up? Okay. So what you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is mostly volunteers, right? Mostly volunteers. And I want to take a minute to say thank you. You've had a huge impact on my life. So if you don't mind a little round of applause, but please stay standing. Stay standing. Okay, the rest of you, would you all stand up right now? Now, we're going to start by getting our blood pressure up a little bit. You know, we're going to talk a lot tonight, and I'm going to get you way out of your comfort zones. While you're standing, I want you to think about one thing, and just one thing only. If you were a superhero, what would your name be? Would you be Mr. Home Depot? <laughs> would you be uh, Miss Linguist? What would your superhero name be? I want you to stay standing just for one more question. If you have an elevator pitch, an elevating pitch done, I'm not going to embarrass you by giving, asking you to say it, but if you have an elevator pitch done, I want you to remain standing. Everybody else, sit down. Elizabeth, it's nice to see you. Okay. So this is the night where the rest of you are going to get your elevator pitches done. It's the night where you can sit back and you please uh, sit down, Donald, thank you. It's the night where you can sit back and you can watch me sing and dance like few others in the stage, right? I can entertain with the best of them, but that's not my purpose. My purpose tonight is for every one of you to realize the value of an elevator pitch and to walk out of here with that elevator pitch in hand. Who doesn't have a piece of paper that uh, was handed out, got a lot of blank lines on one side and some other squiggly stuff? If you don't have one, uh, maybe we could get one in the middle. I want you to do me a favor, turn the blank side towards you, or the one that has all of the blanks on it, right? And I want you to fold that in half and only look at the top half, and I don't want you to write anything on it. Is everybody with me so far? So far. Okay. So we're going to walk out of here with, one, an elevator pitch, and two, we're going to walk out of here with just a little bit more confidence in our shoes than what we started with. So I want you to stand back up with me now. Stand back up. And now I want you to think about this right now. I want you to close your eyes. And you remember that superhero that I asked you to think about? I want you to think about that superhero. Visualize yourself dressed as that human being or that superhuman being. And I want you to feel that cape flapping back behind you. Oh. Wait, wait, your cape is not on. I can see that none of you have your capes on. Open your eyes, 
and I want everybody to reach down in front of you, and I want you to grab that superhero cape. Come on, come on, do it. Re reach down and grab that superhero cape. I want you to throw it around your back. I want you to tie that tassel around your neck, all right, nice and tight to where it doesn't slip. And I want you to look at the person to your immediate right or the one you make eye contact with you. And I want you to introduce, ah, uh, Elisabetta, I think you're not listening to the directions. Stay with me. I want you to introduce yourself to that person, not by your name, but by your superhero name. All right, not yet. All right. And before you let go of that person's hand, I want you to look around and find one other person and grab it. Grab that person. You can let go of your hand and you need to make five total introductions of yourself. Five total, but not as you, as your superhero in persona. Are you with me? Does everybody understand? Okay, a little bit. I, I need a little bit more affirmation than that. So, uh, so we're going to say hua if we understand, all right? Ready? On one, two, three, hua. Ah, okay, a little weak. Do I need to re-explain it? Okay, so you're going to go and you're going to introduce yourself to five people without ever leaving the grasp of a human being's hand. So I would go to Victor and I would shake his hand and I would say, I am Mr. Incredible. <laughs> but before I left his hand, I would go to Taylor and I would go, Taylor, I am Mr. Incredible. And he would be so impressed, he would tell me what his superhero name is. I, Mr. Smiles. He is Mr. Smiles. <laughs> Haven't you always wanted to meet Mr. Smiles? <laughs> and then before we left each other's hands, I would turn and I would grab Laura's hand and she would say, I'm Mrs. Islander. Mrs. Islander. And I would say, I am Mr. Incredible. Are you with me? Does everybody understand? Okay, this is really important, and if you mess this up, we'll do it again, and I don't want to do it again. Are you with me? Just say, give me a hua on three. One, two, three. Hua. Okay, we're going to do hua one more time. One, two, three. Hua. All right. Take that superhero cape and move. Five introductions. Let's go. You got one behind you over here. Keep doing it. All right, as soon as you get done, get back in your seats and you can sit down and relax a little bit. How long has it been since you've thought of yourself as a superhero? How long has it been since you said, I am the guy or I am the gal that I always wanted to be and feel the confidence associated with that? How long has it been since you felt the surge of energy that's contagious when you walk up to somebody and you give it to them and you can see them light up just because you gave it to them? You gave them your incredible self. Tonight, we're going to talk about the incredible, indelible you. We're going to walk through a couple of stages with that. I don't know. We'll just use Mr. Incredible as an example. Mr. Incredible, you know him from the cartoon, but he's one of the greatest superheroes ever. Mr. Incredible was born from the time he was actually a child to all the time he raised up as an adult. He knew what he wanted to be. He wanted to be somebody who could step in and save another's life or step in in a way that would alter them in a positive manner. Mr. Incredible at his heyday, when, when people would call him, they would call out, Mr. Incredible! And he would come in, fly in, and take care of whatever evil was present. Damsels in distress, cities under siege, Mr. Incredible, Bob Parr, hero in victory, 
would come in and waylay, bring peace and tranquility to the environment, and, that, and then he would move on. Bob Parr was always meant to be that person. He was always, from the time he was born until the time he stepped into that role, well, he was somebody. But as with all things, time changes, seasons pass, something happened to Mr. Incredible. You can say it was his fault, but he may have been so doggone good at his job that he eliminated all the bad guys and they no longer found a, a use for Mr. Incredible. He could have actually caused so much collateral damage that people started wailing on him about that more than the, the help he would render. For whatever reason, over the course of just a couple of quick months, Bob Parr found himself not living in victory, but relegated to a position that he couldn't stand. He hated going to every day. They told him not to be himself anymore. And then one day at that job, as all superhumans are, Bob Parr stepped up and hurt somebody. He went in to help and render great aid. And what happened was he ended up driving home that night trying to figure out how he was going to tell his wife he had lost the second job inside of six months. You know, Bob Parr, hero in retreat, is the way many of you feel right now. Sometimes it's really hard to remember how good we are, but there's that good, that incredible human being inside of every one of us. We know we've earned our place, and for whatever reason, just like Bob Parr, things haven't gone our way. But let me ask you a question. Is that guy the same as the one over on the left? Is he still there? Is there some form of Bob Parr, hero in victory, still alive and well? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that in me and in you, I know that superhero exists. He always does. She always does. But it's a mindset. It's what you choose to remember and how you choose to project yourself, which will either be contagious in a good way or contagious in a bad. And tonight we're going to walk back through the goods. Describe these two men for me. Just uh, we'll start out with Bob Parr, hero in victory. Look at him and, and tell me what he is. Tell me, tell me about his mannerisms, his body language. Confident. What else? Powerful. Courageous. Proud. Confident. Would you feel comfortable walking up to Bob Parr? Well, you might. Look at his body language. Is it open? It's projection. You know, there's a bunch of ways that you could actually look at Bob Parr here. And it's the way all of us can be, if we choose to be. Open body language, warm, confident, engaging, positive, exudes energy. Now describe Bob Parr, hero in victory. Hey, hero in retreat. Res describe him for me. Yeah. Say again. Angry. Terrified. Okay, great. Angry. Sad. Sad. Closed. 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 Right. What, what was the last one? Frustrated. Frustrated. There's a whole host of them, right? Neutral to cold. Something about him is not right. But I'll tell you, but he's, when you meet him, you know him right away because he sucks the life right out of you, yeah. right? Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. Have you ever felt when you walk into, a, into an elevator that you, you look at people in a way that they wish they weren't next to you? <laughs> yeah. And you know that when you do that, it changes the energy level in the elevator. And you know when somebody walks in and they're just alive with life and something's happened, you know that's Bob Parr on the left. Which one would you want to work with? Pretty easy question, right? Which person reminds you of you now? That's a harder one to address, and it's mood dependent. Almost every one of you is either out of work or in transition, about to be out of work. How do I know that? Since I've been here, I've been in transition or out of work three times in four years. 
three times in four years. Happens to all of us. But can I tell it? Could you tell it was me, Victor, that was out of job, out of work? I never want to convey that to you. I always want to be Bob Parr, hero in victory. You know, this wall over here is beige. And if you get on the uh, bus, the metro going downtown, um, uh, the subway, you'll see a lot of beige on the bus. Do you see people who make eye contact with you? You see people who are happy, uh, jubilant, uh, wonderful, or do you see a lot of beige when you get on the elevator? I mean, anywhere going downtown. And these are people who have jobs, who are going downtown to work, right? <laughs> right? I got on a bus, and I'm not exaggerating, John Venable, explosive personality, I, I'm going to the Pentagon, I probably shouldn't have been in a good mood. I get on the bus, and one guy on the whole bus is looking at me, and I go, good morning. <laughs> and you know what he said back? What's so good about it? <laughs> that same week, same thing happened to me on the way home. You could say I didn't learn my lesson, but that's the way I am. I look for people who are alive. Employers look for people who are alive. People want to work with people they want to work with. One of the boldest statements that you, more than qualifications, I want to work with a B-plus student more than I want to work with a jerk who's an A-plus, right? And there's a lot of us who are out there who are A-plus students, but we've got to be the people that others want to work with. This beige thought process is out and alive, and what you've got to do is shake it. You've got to be the brick. You've got to be the fire alarm on the wall, not in an obnoxious way, but in a way that lights people up, and tonight we're going to walk just through how to do that. Close your eyes right now. Let's go back to that superhero mindset just for a second. Close your eyes, and I want you to think about the time in your life when you were the most professionally competent, when you were the absolute best at what you did. I want you to think about how people approached you. Were you the center of mass? Were you the cog that everybody else turned around? Were you such an instrumental person that people loved to be with you? And if that's true, what made you so special? What made you so special? Open your eyes right now, and if you haven't got that in your mind, if you haven't got the best of them, I want you to pick the one that came to mind. I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. First person you make eye contact with, go to them right now. One-on-one. -on -one. Okay, the person on the right side of the room, on this side of the room, is going to be the listener. And the person on this side of the room is going to be the talker. And I want you, in two minutes, I want you to tell them what you did at the best time of your life and what made you so special. Go. You by yourself, Tom? Do you want to do it? Huh? You want to go? Up there? No, just talk with me. Oh, okay. So, I, I'll be the observer. You tell me. Okay. Well, back in 2007, I did some research on the rubber plantation industry in Liberia. And in 2008, I was able to save up enough money, and I went there and I set up a consultancy. And I went up and I found 79 farms within the heart of the country that had been depleted by the war. And I was able to present a, a plan to rejuvenate those farms. And I found some investors as well as some workers to help to rejuvenate those farms. And it was a management consulting type career that had me excited for the first time in a very long time. How about that? That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. I don't think my slide moved. Let's see. What made, me so, what made me so special? I had never done anything like that before. I 
I knew absolutely nothing about the rubber fermentation industry before I started, by the end of it. I was bursting with information about it, and a lot of people wanted to listen to what I had to say, even though I wasn't necessarily a, uh, a, 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 a veteran in, in the industry. A lot of the veterans are coming to me for advice. So. Outstanding. Okay, thank you. I'll be right back. Okay, it's been two minutes. Let's go ahead and stop the conversation. Okay, now we're gonna swap roles. Everybody listening? I want you to swap roles. If you were the observer before, now you get to convey. What is it that you did, and why were you so special in that role? You got two minutes. <laughs> my, my timer. Is actually working. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I thought you're you're great. Your projection's wonderful. And confidence, eye contact. We're going to talk about that with everybody else. But you've got this cinch down. I've, I've seen enough of your presentations to know exactly how to do it. <laughs> so huh. I give the credit to you. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Thanks. Okay, that's two minutes. Let's go ahead and come back to your seats and, uh, and just take, take a breath. So how'd we do? You had two minutes to talk about you. And when you reflect, not on the other person, but you reflect on yourself, were you confident? Eye contact, warm, open, direct, eye to eye, or did you have an issue with it? Did you come off a little bit shyer or, or a little bit less confident than you wanted to? Two minutes is a long time to talk. It doesn't put any time constraint on you, so you can blab all you want. In an elevator pitch, we've only got about 30 to 45 seconds total. So we're going to trim that, that time period down, but I could see a lot of animation you know, this, uh, this big handsome guy over here that gave his, uh, his uh, not his elevator pitch, but his uh, victory lap, Donald, he is one of the most confident guys you'll ever meet, and he never is down. His voice, when he was up here talking, was something that I hope to harvest, uh, you know, into the movies or something. He's just, got, he's just got that baritone voice. If Darth Vader is looking for a follow-on, that guy's got it, right? And when you talk to him, he, he just is absolutely big, beam and smile. It's contagious, right? Were you that or were you something short of that? It doesn't happen overnight. No slanderous stone thrown. Trust me, if you've lost your job, it's kind of like getting hit in the head with a two by four. It doesn't matter if you were the one who was wielding the ax they drug out in a straight jacket or if it was the other person and you just barely got out of there with your lie. It doesn't matter how you lost your job. This is one of those things that's a debilitator. It's like pulling the carpet out from underneath you. And learning resiliency, I guarantee you, is a learned science. Nobody takes a two by four in the forehead and goes, give me another, I'm ready to go. Nobody does it. You've got to learn to walk away from it 
And this process of building your elevator pitch is so very powerful. So open body language, warm, confident, engaging, positive. It's somebody that you want to be hired by. You would hire you. Exuding confidence is what you want to be able to walk through this process and deliver. You don't want to be the, the hero in retreat. You don't want to be Bob Parr always running away. And this is the time where you catch your breath and you do it. Okay, this is the time. Now, the question that I would ask you observers, and this is one of those very biting questions. When you were listening to the other person talk, could you tell what it was that they did? Or do you have a really hard time putting your finger on it? Are they good at what they do? It's a really tough question. How can you tell if I'm a good diamond cutter? You know, my skill set, I'm the guy who makes 14 carats into beauty, right? I take these stones and I cut them and I craft them. How can you tell that I'm good at what I do? I could walk around with a whole display and, and show you. But when I talk positively about what I do, and I tell you how much I love it, that's the telltale signs. That's all you've got to taste test and sample and says, this is somebody I want to cut my stones. The same thing is true in any job, ladies and gentlemen. It's not your resume that is going to get you into most doors. It's your connections. Quick story, Memphis, Tennessee. I, I have a small business down there I'm part of. I was in the military for 26 years. Right across the street is somebody we do business with. They have a salesman. We talk quite a bit. One day, this guy shows up and the phone rings. And it's not the salesman, but the salesman's on the phone. He says, hey, I just sent somebody over to you. He's in the military. You're going to love him. He walks in the door, and this guy says, I just retired from 24 years in, in the Armed Forces Reserve, in the Army Reserve. And that was the most positive thing he said for the next two hours. The rest of it was, those bastards, they did this. I can't believe they did that. And, and so I, I'm a coach, right? I, I know all this stuff. And I was talking to him. And I was trying to lift him up. But it kept going down and down. And honestly, the guy needed a therapist. He didn't need me. He really did. He was so far into the negative side. And I will never get those two hours of my life back. <laughs> and so the first thing, when he finally left my office, and by the way, I was very grateful that I wasn't harmed in the filming of that two hours. When he left, I picked up the phone, and you know what I did? I called my salesman buddy across the street, and I said, don't ever send me anybody again. You didn't take the time to get to know them. You didn't screen them before you entered my network. And it was a debilitating two hours. Don't, I, I talked to them a little nicer than that, but I conveyed that in exact terms. In order to get to your job, it's nine out of 10. Nine out of 10 jobs are done through networking. And you've got to convince me that you are the person I need to introduce Bob Korzanuski to. And that doesn't happen in just a 10 or a 20 or a 45 second conversation, but you got to capture me during that time. And that's what an elevator pitch is for. You got to capture me. And then I say, Eliz Elizabeth, let's go do coffee. I would love to talk to you about what the potential holds. And then when I do my due diligence, then I go, you're worth my time and you're worth an introduction and a risk that I will take with my friend. Does that make sense? This is one of the many tools for this elevator pitch. Do, do you know what you do? Are you good at what you do? And do I buy it? Do I really think that you think you're good? You'd be surprised. And tonight, we're going to do a little bit of that self-analysis, OK? So what's an elevator pitch? Quick question, no real response. An elevator pitch is a very short conversation that conveys to somebody else that you are the honey they can't live without. 
You are the boat that they have to jump on. You are the person that they can't afford to let out of the elevator without getting your card. That's what an elevator pitch is. Two things about an elevator pitch. You tell me what you do, and you convey it in a way that makes me believe that you are the best thing and the brightest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, at least during that four, last four hours. And I will do everything I can to help you. A very short conversation about how very special you are. It leads to another conversation, that coffee. When I look at you and go, I want to get to know you better before I introduce you into my network. That leads to another conversation and then potentially an interview and then potentially a job. But that's the metering process that you go through. And it works anytime, anywhere. You want to go to dinner with me? My wife would advise not to. The, every time, every time we go to sit down, she cringes because the waiter will come up and, and I will look at the waiter right in the eye and I'll go, who are you? And my wife will go, it's the waiter. <laughs> and nine times, 99 times out of 100, the waiter will say, I'm your waiter. Can I get you something to drink? And I'll go, well, yes, you can. Can I get your name? And that's the end of that. But one time out of maybe 100, that person will respond, who am I? I may be the greatest opera singer you've ever heard. I'm studying right across the street at Carnegie Mellon. You haven't heard my name yet, but in five years, you'll know who I am. But right now, I'm just a person working in the greatest restaurant in this city, meeting fabulous people like you. Sir, can I get you a drink? And that person, I don't know anybody in the opera industry, but I'll guarantee you I took that person's card. You're not in the opera industry, and I want to help you. At least I think I do. Your job is to make me want to help you. And be that one out of 100, that, that, that uh, fire alarm in an otherwise beige, beige wall. It conveys three basic things, this elevator pitch. Who you are, what you do, and why you're so doggone special. Those three things are fundamental to everything else that we're going to talk about tonight. But there are a few rules that go into that. And these are rules just like, you know, um, back in the 1800s, cattle ranchers hated fences, right? Certainly cowboys hated fences. Fighter pilots hate rules. I used to be a fighter pilot for a long time. But what I'm going to give you are very strong guidelines, okay? The first one is be elevating. An elevator pitch is, a, is basically a name that says you've got a short period of time to get across a very important conversation before they get off of the elevator. You want to work for the White House? President Obama hops in the elevator next to you, and you've got five floors to catch his attention. How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? you got to be elevating, and you got to be prepared. Nothing off-putting, nothing negative. You know, uh, my name is John Venable, and I may be the most fortunate man you've ever met in your life. For, for 26 years, I got to fly F-16s all over the world right up before that, that hard landing. <laughs> Nothing. Here's one that doesn't sound very off-putting. My name is John Venable, and, and I've been a part of the DOD structure here in the consulting world for a lot of years. I just have had an incredible run with Booz Allen. Worked for him for over 20 years. Fabulous company, right up until the time they went public. <laughs> My name is John Venable, and I'm, I'm in environmental sciences. I graduated with a PhD, and my specialty is global warming. It's happening all around you, in case you haven't taken the time to notice. <laughs> Half the people are Democrats. Half the people are Republicans. You want to capture them all, right? Half the people believe that global science says, and it's happening, the world is getting warmer. And those people are going to love you for that statement. But the other half of the elevator, the ones that may have that job, are going to be insulted by the fact that you don't think they're smart enough to make up their own mind. Nothing negative. And so here's a negative one. 
My name's John Venable, and I'm an astrophysicist. I, I worked in NASA for 25 years. I, I, I was the guy who did the math so that astronauts could rendezvous with everything from the, the, the International Space Station to errant space junk. Um, uh, um, at least I used to do that. Everybody's got two lines. You do. You don't need to go through this process until you get through those two lines and you think you can tap dance your way through it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where it's going to get you. This is nothing negative. No less, my name is John Venable and I am really handsome, smart. I'm a good dancer. I graduated from uh, my high school with a 4.0, went to Harvard for uh, business school in Yale, and I graduated magna cum laude uh, in my, uh, my law class. Number one, nobody cares. <laughs> Number two, you're arrogant, and that is off-putting. Any time you come up with lists, even if I graduated from, uh, I've got my bachelor's and I've got my master's and I've got my PhD in physics, nobody cares. They want to know what you do in layman's terms. And they don't care. You'll roll the eyes in the back of their head over a book of lists, okay? Lists are things that you sit back and they're the easy things to do. I worked here, I did this, I did that, I did that, and now I'm looking for. Nobody cares. You get on an elevator, and you know most people are looking for that elevator music. Their minds will take them to Tahiti. They'll be on a beach. They'll be hearing waves crashing. For you younger folks, you'll be in Twitter land going, wow, I'm thinking about electrons. When somebody turns and talks to you and wants to tell you what, what, what they do, you've got one sentence. That person has one sentence to capture your interest. Else you'll look at them, you'll nod, nod politely and go, Oh, I can feel the water against my toes. You want to hold them. It's a fight one at a time. 30 to 45 seconds max, unless you are an author and a publicist who can speak and, and talk and carry people's interests like, like, I don't know, a good name to give you. 30 to 45 seconds is all, and in that time, you want to be able to, to convey who you are, what you do, and why you're so doggone special. You want to include all six elements of the things that I'm going to give you in a couple of minutes, unless they're obvious. If you are a, a mortician and I'm looking for the next dead body is something you don't need to say, right? If you're a motivational speaker, I'm looking for my next gig. It's one of those things that everybody realizes, so you don't need to say it. But you're going to need to say all of the six pieces I'll give you in just a second. No technical jargon. My name is John Venable. I just retired from the United States Air Force. 26 years, fabulous career. I worked for CSAP and SECAF, working JCD and E issues for GIFCOM and NORAD. And now I'm looking for, you think that's bad? Every one of you's got it. Every one of you's got some little piece of jargon that you use. And if, if people can't follow it, they're going to step out into Twitter land or into Tahiti. You've got to stay the course and, and, and talk to them in a way that works. OK, so here's a, here's a test question, and you can call out the answers. If, if you want to target a group of people, you know, hiring managers are 45 to 55 years old, right? So if you're going to target somebody, that might be your pick here. But you get in an elevator, and you don't know who in the elevator is there. Do you target a 16-year-old male, the, the education and language capability of a 16-year-old male, a 26-year-old female, a 36-year-old male, a 46-year-old female, or a 56-year-old male? Which one do you pick? 16. Why? Why 16? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Yes, it does. Well done. And you cheated. You were at my table last week, too. Can I, I can give you another answer. All right. Um, because you don't know their education level. Um, you know, you're going to target somebody who's going to be in their 40s, and they're going to be in their 40s. Right. So you could be talking to a house husband who's never graduated from college. You could be talking to someone who's so steeped in physics that they can't tie their, their shoes in the morning. Right? They don't have any outside understanding at all. And so you want to pick the audience that's probably the most naive or, 
or the one that you need to target and have the hardest time. I have a 16-year-old son, and my, my window language is about that high, right? I, I've got, that, got a gap this high. If I shoot underneath it and I talk down to him, he turns me off, and I'll get that, you know, almost a hate, hateful look. If I talk over his head, he'll go, and I, nothing sinks in. And so I really have to target that point. What is a gynecologist to a 16-year-old male? It's that Geico commercial, right? It's that, it's that lizard, and he represents that people. A 16-year-old female is more worldly than a 16-year-old male. Target that audience and target your language for that point. That's what you want to fixate on. Okay, are you with me? Does this make sense to you? You get on an elevator and you have a physicist, you have a nurse, you have a doctor, you have a, um, a life support technician from a hospital, and you're in the sales business and you sell prosthetic devices. Who are you going to talk to? And what language are you going to pick? It happens to all of us. The physicist, or the, I'm sorry, the physician and the nurse may understand what you say, but they may not have a job for you. It's the people in the elevator writ large that you want to capture. No technical jargon. And do your best to eliminate it. And when you start hearing yourself enunciate it, figure out a way to wipe it out. No ums, no ahs, no gaps, no pause that makes you want to fill it with, I was employed right up until the time of that axe murdering, right? <laughs> and that's going to take practice. Um, I came here uh, four years ago uh, unemployed. And the guy who, who recommended the place said, make sure you have your elevator pitch ready because when you go into this uh, CNM, they're going to make you stand up and you're going to have to give your elevator pitch. And so I practiced all the way here. 30-second elevator pitch, 45-minute drive. You do, the, you do the math. You can work a whole lot of practice in there and have fun with it. We're going to go through some examples in here and I'll show you. The last thing I'll leave you with is if you want to if you want to fill all of the gaps and you want to go through this process and you would say, "I'm this, I'm that." You get to the end and you're not elevating to yourself, you won't be elevating to anybody else. So, here's a couple of fun ones, all right? We're going to go through and we're going to have fun with this. Who are you? What do you do and why are you supposed so special? I'm a mortician. If a mortician can have a decent elevator pitch, anybody in this room can have a decent elevator pitch. Would you agree with me? All right. What do you do? I, you're going to fill this sheet out in just a second. Please don't yet. But this is what I mean with have fun with it and be blunt force trauma if you need to. What do you do? Really? Really? I'm a mortician. Really? You don't know what I do? I, I, I bury dead people mostly. Why are you so special? I help people embrace the most emotionally significant moments in their lives, the loss of someone they love. And this is when you start touching on why you are so special, why you got into the career field you're in, or why you got into the one that just left you. Who are you? I, I drive heavy uh, earth moving equipment. You, you, you probably don't know. What do you do? I, I help shape the foundation for the World Trade Center. You, you know, the, the one, the, the memorial after we lost the two buildings? I, I did that. Oh, I, I get a sight picture of what you want. Why are you so special? I take a little pride, more than a little, in what I do, and I approached every location that I've ever moved into with the same level of respect that I did the World Trade Center memorial. Great foundation. Who are you? I'm a real estate agent. What do you do? Over the last two years, I've sold more properties in Springfield, Virginia than anybody else. That's what I do. Why are you so special? I love people more than I love real estate. These lines are starting to resonate with you. It's not really important what you think that's important to the rest of the world. You're talking to an elevator that has no idea what you do. You're an astro what? You're an astrophysicist? What does that mean? You better take the time to explain it. What do you do? I, I just recently graduated from George Mason. How do you build an elevator pitch off of that? Oh, wait, it gets worse. What do you do? Uh, my, my major was physics. Why are you so special? I love math. 
I, lo I love math. That makes me special, doesn't it? It's got to be you, right? This is you-centric. It's not about what you're going to make me feel good about. It's about what makes you light up to talk about. Does everybody get that? That's the foundation for the elevator pitch. Get it because it's coming at you. My name is John Venable. I go by JV. I, I got up on a roof when I was four years old for all the wrong reasons, and when I was up there, something powerful happened. Three airplanes came over so low and so loud, I almost fell off the roof. I was so excited I could have peed my pants. But I knew right then and there this was the dream of my lifetime. It didn't take me long to realize that what I really, really wanted was to be the commander of the Thunderbirds, not just to fly, not just to fly fighters, but to, but to be the commander of that team. For a bunch of years in the Air Force, I did incredible things, and I lived a life like few rock and roll stars could compete with. I, I did that for a living every day. I got so close to this objective of wanting to be the Thunderbird commander that I could taste it, but then I hit a wall like few others. I was diagnosed with cancer. My mom died of cancer. My sister was in her eighth year of, uh, of a terminal bout of ovarian cancer when I was diagnosed. And I, 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 to be honest with you, it was the scariest time of my life. Who are you? What do you do? And why are you so special? I'm a fighter pilot turned motivational speaker. That's what I do. I fight my way through heavily defended targets to get where I need to go. Why am I supposed so special? I made it all the way to my childhood dream in spite of one of the biggest two by fours that you can imagine. I believe that anything's possible. That's what makes me special. But what makes you special? It's your turn. I want you to take that top sheet of the paper and I want you to tell me, I want you to write out and tell you who are you? What do you do? And why are you so special? You got five minutes. Make it happen. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get back at it. If you've got a, just another line or two, go ahead and finish writing it, but the rest of us are going to move forward. And I'm going to show you how easy this is, how easy a process it is to build an elevator pitch from what you've got, whatever it is. Who are you, what do you do, and why are you so special? Remember, the idea behind this is to separate yourself from everybody else who's just marching through life or to an interview or just getting on another elevator. You want to separate yourself. You want to be the person who stands out. Who wants to stand out right now and tell me who they are, what they do, and why they are so, so special? Yes, sir, in the back. Do we have a microphone in the back by chance, Dave? Hi, my name is John Barsa. I'm a government relations professional with a background in corporate business development. I, I work with Congress, think tanks, and the executive branch to promote the companies I represent. I understand how everything in this town works together and how politics, policy, procurement influence each other. Awesome. Awesome. How long do you think that took? Probably around 20 to 25 seconds. It actually was shorter than what you think. And he's got lots of room at the end to close, close solidly, right? When he read it, did it sound a little stilted right in there? Just a little bit like he was reading it? This is one of the first stages of... of of your elevator pitch, when you get it down and you memorize it, it it's going to sound stilted initially, but then when you really get it down, it's going to come off so slick that you're going to sound like a salesman. And you don't want to do that. You want to move to the next level where you're so comfortable giving it that it's a conversation, not a sales pitch. Very nice. Nicely done. One more. Anybody else? Sir? Hello, my name is William Davis, and I'm a Navy non-commissioned officer in transition. I specialize in human resource management, and I love working with people to help them solve their complex issues. Awesome. Okay, so really quick and to the point, let me ask you a question. What does he do for a living? 
What, what is it? HR. HR, human resources. Is he employed or is he unemployed? In transition. One of the things you might want to think about doing is just talking about what you've done and what you're going to do next. We'll talk about how to make that transition in a minute. Where you are right now is different than where most people are in the transition process. When you're stepping out of the service and you're still employed and you know you're going to make that transition, it's powerful. There's some uncertainty there, but you still got that wave of, of power behind you of a great career, right? But when you've been swimming in that, that abyss for a while of not having a job, saying the words in transition can suck the life out of you and you want to avoid it. And so this is one where I would recommend you, you kind of ease away from that and we'll talk about how to do that in just a second. Okay, an elevating pitch. These are the six elements. Your name, what you do, why you're so special. We pretty much already got those down. Now all we have to do is add what you're going to do next. And in the process of saying all of that stuff, you want to include an emotional hook. Now what's an emotional hook? Passion. It's absolute passion, showing passion for what you do, using the words, I love, I really enjoy, I get a kick out of. That's showing passion. And that, in, in elevator speak, means you not only love your job, but you're very good at it too. It's the only assumption they can make. If you leave them sitting on a fence that says, I'm not sure whether he likes his job or not, the default is you don't and you're not worth my time. You got to be the honey that catches everybody. Um, so include an emotional hook and then your name on the, uh, give them your name again with a card. We'll, we'll uh, give you some details on how to get a card if you don't have one. But ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the links of killing an elevator pitch, and you're, you're standing next to President Obama and you want to work in the White House and you give this great pitch and he gets off the elevator and, and you haven't given him your name in a way that he can walk off, great conversation. You'll be able to talk about it for the rest of your life, missed opportunity. Because President Obama is a little too busy to go and I think he, he was tall, kind of geeky looking, big Adam's apple. Could you find somebody in the city that looks like that? So have a car. This thing right here about what you're going to do next is something we haven't included. What are you going to do next? Not what are you looking for? What are you going to do next? My name is John Venable and I'm an astrophysicist. I'm the guy who did all the math processing for astronauts so they could rendezvous with everything from errant space junk to the International Space Station. I did that for NASA and now I'm looking to train and raise the next generation of mathematicians to get them to love math the way I love math. And as soon as George Mason finds out I'm available, we're going to go to the moon together. It all connects. I never told them I was out of work. I never told them that the reason that Challenger blew up was because of a math error that I did. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I didn't happen to include that. Everybody has those moments, right? You want to walk away from them. And when they come up, we'll talk about a way to address them in another time. But it's all positive, 100% what you do, why you're so doggone special, and what you're going to do next, okay? So who are you? What do you do? And why are you so special? You remember our friend, the undertaker, right? He's a mortician, and he helps families embrace the most emotionally significant moments of their lives, the loss of someone they love. This is how easy building an elevator pitch is. My name is Grave Digger, and I may be the most fortunate man you've ever met. I help families embrace the most emotionally significant moments in their lives, the loss of someone they love. I've taken great pride in helping Texas families illuminate and cherish these precious memories in moving celebrations and now I'm, I'm actually transitioning here to my to Virginia and I'm looking forward to doing the same thing my name is Grave Digger and it was a pleasure meeting you <laughs> now 
we talked about this before. There's no what I'm looking for next, right? Uh, if you're a real estate agent, you know, don't need to include that. If you're a mortician, you, you don't need to include what you're looking for next. It's obvious, right? This is how easy it is to do. Now, I'm not feeling sick, but if I was in an elevator and, and grave digger stood next to me and he gave me this pitch, I would tell him, dude, I'm not feeling bad, but I really thought that was moving. Could I have one of your cards? My name is John Venable, and I'm a mortician. I've dug a lot of graves for a lot of people, and you're not looking so good yourself. <laughs> Do you know what the heebie-jeebies are? Hi, <laughs> get me off the elevator. It's a completely different thought process. Well, the, the really stark reality is you can be that mortician if you're not careful, talking about you and your job, and you got to make it, you got to make it where it flows like honey. Who are you? I, I drive earth moving equipment. I help shape the foundation of the World Trade Center Memorial in New York, and I take a lot of pride in what I do. This is a dump truck driver. It's a dump truck driver, but this is what his pitch could look like. My name is Digger Dumper, and I move mountains. I've been behind the wheel of every kind of earth moving equipment you can imagine and I take more than a little pride in what I do. I helped shape the foundation of the World Trade Center Memorial in New York City. And while that was a special opportunity, I've approached every location with the same level of respect, care, and craftsmanship. I just brought my trade here to Northern Virginia, and, and I gotta tell you, I couldn't be more excited about the shape of things to come. My name is Digger Dumper, and this is my card. Dude, you tell me if a guy gave you that pitch, you wouldn't take his card and keep it with you for the rest of your life. You just don't meet earth-moving equipment people who talk that way, right? <laughs> you just don't. And when you do, you know he drives that truck better. He deserves your business or your dad's business or your neighbor's business. And that's what keeps people in a network. And that what's, that's what moves you to a pile that's at the very top of other piles. It's you and how you convey it. I'm a real estate agent. Um, over the last two years, sold more properties in Virginia, Springfield than anybody else. I did it in a way that make the buyer and the seller more happy uh, than, than they would have been otherwise. Here is a pitch. My name is Bevy O Realty, and I move houses. Over the last two years, I've sold more properties in Springfield, Virginia than anybody else. And I've done it so that both the buyer and the seller walk away better for the transaction. The secret is not in loving real estate. The secret is in loving people. My name is Bevy O Realty. It was a pleasure to meet you. You're not selling your house now, but I'll guarantee you, if you met this person, it would cause you to want to keep that card when you do sell it or when you're looking to buy. She's not looking to screw anybody in the process. She's looking to make you happy. You take this card and she's in your network for life. You want to be that person who's in my network for life. You want to be that person, whether you think I can help you or not, I always can. Who are you? I'm a recent graduate from George Mason. I, my major was physics and I, I just love math. My name is Robert Oppenheimer, <laughs> and I just finished my bachelor's degree of Bachelor of Arts here in Northern Virginia. I've always loved math, and that feeling exploded during my, my four years in the physics program here at George Mason. While the course was incredibly challenging, conquering it has given me the footing I need to, 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 to move into my lifelong dream into the Naval Research Lab here on the northeastern side of D.C. And as soon as they find out I'm available, we'll go to the moon together. This is a recent graduate from college. Do you want to help this kid or not? You want to take his card, and he's going to have a card. If he has this pitch, he's going to have a card. And you want to you come, and you want to share it with everybody who can help you. 
you're going to meet him for coffee, and you're going to help him with his resume. You do everything you can to get that guy seated. That's what the purpose of an elevator pitch is. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you so special? It's your turn. On that front page, before we go anyplace else, open it up wide open, and look, and there's another line right below the crease, and it's what are you going to do next? It's very important to get specific about what you do next. If you're a, a DOD contractor and you're looking for work, you work for Booz Allen and now you're looking for some other contractor kind of like Booz Allen, that doesn't let me help you because I don't know what the government contracting business is. There's this guy who's the CEO for SAIC who lives next door to me, but I really don't know how to help you. If you say the words SAIC, or targeting someone like Deloitte Touche. People, it just lights them up. It gives them a sight picture of where you want to go. And they may have somebody with a, a, a boutique contracting agency right next to you, Whitney Bradley and Brown, that you would much rather wor work for. And if you capture them and give them that sight picture, they're going to walk your card right next door. Right? That's what the purpose of this is. Give them a visual sight picture. Now, Whitney Bradley and Brown, how many people have heard of WBB here in town? Okay, so two, three hands, really high end, pay, a, pay you a lot more than other contractors, and they charge the government more than other contractors do, but, but they're really sought after. But if you don't capture everybody in the elevator, if you don't give them a sight picture that they can walk away with, Whitney Bradley and Brown, you know what that is? Taylor, I have no idea. Give them a big sight picture. Write it down right now. Where do you want to go next? Write it down. While you've got that fold open, you've got the contents, the blanks for an elevator pitch right in front of you. It's your turn. Take what's up on top of that sheet and move it into an elevator pitch that sings. Nothing negative, no gaps, doesn't have to be grandiose, just has to bring your passion out. You got 10 minutes, make it happen. Okay, we're gonna run ourselves out of time, so I apologize. Let's go ahead and uh, stop where you are right now, if you, if you haven't, or if you wanna keep writing, please do, but we're gonna continue moving forward. Okay, the idea, remember, is to be that fire alarm, not the obnoxious one, but the one that really stands out in a group of people. The elements of an elevating pitch are here for you to look at one more time. Who are you? What do you do? And why are you so special? Is there somebody who's willing to stand out right now and give their elevator pitch to the group? Excellent. You have a mic? Good evening, my name is Dave, Dave Womack. I'm a policy analyst. I take the complex world of the Middle East, international relations, and strategic policy, and I make it understandable. I've served ambassadors, generals, royal family members, and even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Take, I take great pride in ensuring my boss is the most informed and most prepared in the meeting room. And I'm look. <clears throat> You're doing great. I know. Uh, How about that, Mr. Incredible? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I'm looking for the next leader to make successful. How about that? Hey. All right. So, Dave, let me ask you a question or two. Uh, you can go back and stand, or, or you, however you want to do it. Would you rather work for a state senator? Would you rather work for a congressman? Is there somebody that you can say, I'm looking for? That's a good, um, a military leader. Okay, so let me, let me say it was great, loved it, but this is the thing that he leaves me in the lurch for, because I have a lot of politics in my house, but I don't pay very well, you know what I mean? So. The, the, this thought process of being able to help you is what I want. Okay. All right, so if you can give me a sight picture, uh, uh, a senator with somebody on your staff, like you on the staff, would be incredible. I would add that. Thought the length of your presentation was just perfect. Love the eye contact. So here's the reading thing, right? 
I'll take it from you. Thank you very much. Here's the reading thing. A lose eye contact when you stammer, when you, and, and, and we wrote that tonight, right? So completely understandable. You want to work that out. And when he does, he's going to be a powerhouse, right? That's an incredible the, the foundation for an incredible pitch. Who else? And he, was a red badger. and he was a red badger. What does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was like, um, you know, red flag, the ultimate game. Or, you know, he was somebody in the KGB who slipped over, killed a couple of guys, got back. Okay, so who's going to be somebody else who stands out? Okay, so this is the deal. You go to a networking event, and they ask this question, and there's somebody with a job that you want, but you're sitting on your hands, and you won't move to help yourself. This is a time when it's free to practice and free to get that, that uh, little feedback back. We have one over here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jean Connors, and I love not only to read and tell stories with kids, but also engage them in deep conversation, seminar style. I had a hand in classrooms around the world, and I'm something of, with mostly middle and high school kids, and I'm something of a maverick with a love for philosophical discussion, a gadfly. And I'm looking to do the same with adults in working with ideas and people in other venues. It's rough. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, love the passion. I, I heard the voice in there that says, I love, I, maverick is one of those words that can cut both ways, but it means you're passionate, right? So that's some, something that you convey. But what does she do? Ask you the question, what does she do? She's a storyteller. What does she do? So there's not a lot of people who are calling out the answer, and that's a little bit of feedback, right? When you stand in front of an empty room of chairs, and I swear to you, I'm not as crazy as I sound. I talk to empty rooms all the time at home practicing, and you know what's scary? Is the chairs talk back. <laughs> and they go, JV, that may be the coolest thing you've ever said in your life. <laughs> and I write it down. He rarely says that, that chair. But then he'll say something like, I didn't understand that. When you enunciate it out loud, there's something really weird about it. You actually hear it. It's like reading out loud. It's a different level of consciousness. So practice this out loud and you will hear your clarity or you will hear something ah, that just doesn't sound right. How do I get these lines? And you go back and refine it. Does that make sense? So school teacher. Um, I have the certification, but I get in trouble with the conventional setting. I get into loggerheads with the bureaucrats. You know, oh. I do. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. So what do you want to convey? And you don't have to answer that now. And what is it that you really want to so do? So I was dancing around, right. you know, yes, yeah, something. And, and so yet, if I don't know what I you think, want, I can't help you. Can, how do you convey that you're a live wire? And that, <laughs> you know, that's part of what makes you, you know, it's your strength, but it also is what will get you in trouble in a bureaucracy. So I would turn that question around, and I would get you to write that over and over again until you get it right. What do you want to convey? I can spend some time with yeah, you one-on-one gotcha. on one next okay. week, nope. and I'll be at this table every Tuesday night if you want to come. And if you want to send me your elevator pitch, I would love to refine it. And I, I'm, I, I'm not your best friend, but I am. I'll cut to the quick, and I'll say, dude, I don't know if you work in a laundromat or if you are actually an astronaut. I don't know. <laughs> right? I, I will tell you. But then I will send you helpful lines, and I will say, if this is what you do, this is how I would rearrange it and how I would flow it out. Okay? Deal? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come up and do it to you. All right, come on. I'm going to be in the elevator. All right. I'm in the elevator. Uh, what floor can I get for you? Five. Five? Who are you? I'm Katie Smeltz, and I'm a social worker, and I'm a connector. I run support groups. Um, I truly love interacting with people and connecting with, with people. Through these connections, miracles have happened. 
I've been, I've, I've been advocating for my son who has autism. In fact, 10 waiters from the Silver Diner are gonna be at his birthday party through my networking and connecting. The media is gonna be there. They're volunteering their time through my passion for helping him with social skills. I've made connections with our community and we're not isolated anymore. Um, I'm looking to work in the healthcare setting as a caregiver and connector to continue my work as a caregiver. Um, I'm Katie Smelt, and here's my card. Excellent. All right. All right. So what was the coolest aspect of her pitch? This huge beaming smile on her face, right? A huge beaming smile. Passion, she spoke with it throughout. Anybody want to argue that? Just absolutely oozing with passion. What does she want to do? Okay, are you hearing different answers? Are you hearing different answers? So, so look, I, I, my name is John Venable, and, and I, I am one of the most uh, fortunate men you've ever met. I, I have gotten to fly F-16s all over the world. My wife makes me drive all over town, and I go to 7-Eleven, and sometimes I get to, uh, I get to come back. But, but I'll tell you that I'm looking to pursue my career with Delta Airlines. So my trip, the trip that I take you on, has got to be linear, right? And if I have a story that's really a cool story and shows you my passion but is not related to the job that I'm trying to get you to hear what I love, then it's got to go. It's, this has got to be passion about your life in the workforce and, and tied to that specific job in order to help you out. Does that make sense? Incredible passion, maybe a, a smidge too long. But this, this linear path, let's see if we can line that one up. Is it a professional example? A professional example. A really moving story about, about your son. Very moving and how you're able to sway people. Is that related to what you want to do? So this is the refining process. One more? Okay, this is the last one, and then we're going to yeah, question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. My name is Andrea Bomar, and I'm a writer and editor from a marketing background. I use my writing talents to help companies and organizations tell compelling stories that resonate with people. I love to craft messages that really speak to readers and inspire them to take action, whether it's buying a product or joining a cause. I want to join a communications team of a world-changing nonprofit and inspire support for the cause through a powerful message. Outstanding. Okay. So ye who are timekeepers, how long was that? So let me ask you a question. Did you stay with her the entire time? Did you ever want to step off the elevator? Did you ever hear that, that uh, music hit you and the waves pounding at your feet? No. Captivating throughout. I would say it was probably closer to 45 seconds than it was 30 but it was a long ball. You hit a long ball there. Okay, so one re refinement I could give you is give me a sight picture of the nonprofit that you want to work for. If I tell you I'm a consultant in DOD, what does that mean to you? You know, I could be a brain surgeon consultant or I could be a refuse consultant and anything in between. I'm a consultant. I'm an accountant. What do you do in your world that makes you special? Okay, and what, do you, what is it that you really do? Really important, loved it. Okay, love the, love the pitch, love the power, love the passion. That sight picture at the end, if I could get you to give me a little bit better one, I, it would go, it would be a perfect pitch. I hear what my, if I'm more interested in the writing itself than where I do it? Then, then you need to basically, did you, I didn't get the feeling that it was the writing so much, which was the, the thing. So if that's where you want to go, then you need to make that the focus of your pitch, right? So you said, what was the exact line that you used marketing with? What was it? It was the first or second sentence. 
a writer and editor from a marketing background? Right. Writer and editor with a marketing background. How does marketing play there? Which do you want? And this is the confusion. This is the clarity. So if I tell you that uh, I'm a brain surgeon who also places, plays hopscotch, how does that fit in? Those are two extremes, right? If you ride two dolphins at work, you got to pick one of them to catch, capture me, and I will tell you all about that one when we're done, okay? When I'm done with the pitch and, you, and I incite that conversation out of you, then we'll talk about that other dolphin. Does that make sense? Okay. We had a question earlier about what if your profession is not the profession that you want to talk about? That's a great question, and there's a lot of sorting to that. Hey, my name's John Venable, and I'm an astrophysicist. I've worked in that industry for a little over 30 years with NASA, and I've done some extraordinary things. But now I'm actually looking to get into name the brain surgery. I'd like to be a brain, brain surgeon. Can you give me uh, any connections on uh, how I might be able to get hooked up with brain surgery? <laughs> this is the chasm that you've got to cross. So if you're going to talk about what you do, and you're going to move into something that you want to do, that might take a little bit of, 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 of effort. And you might want to pick and choose. So I'm a graphic artist, but I've always wanted to step up into the marketing world, right? I've worked for one firm after another as a graphic artist, but I've learned the industry and I'm looking for that next level of challenge, right? Marketing and graphic artistry are not the same thing. Two almost entirely different sciences that happen to coincide. But if you learn so much about it, this is how you could say it. I've loved graphic art artistry, for, and I've been involved with it for this company and this company, and now I'm, I'm looking to, to take what I've learned up to the next level and integrate it into the world of marketing. And then you would go in and tell how you're qualified or what you've done or where your passion lies for that. But it's a step up, not a complete leap from one lily pad to another. Does that make sense? And that leap is a very tough one to do in the elevator pitch. I'll talk to you one-on-one -on, -one on that, okay? All right, so this being special is a big deal. This who you are, what you do, and why you're so special, I told you what I did. I told you my background, and let me tell you the rest of it. This is my elevator pitch. My name is J.V. Venable, and I may be the most fortunate man you've ever met. I'm a storyteller who was born with a dream like few others. For 15 years out of college, I, I lived a life like few rock and roll stars and flew the F-16 all over the world. And I was within arm's reach of the biggest dream of my life, to be the commander and demonstration leader of the Thunderbirds when I, when I ran into a wall like few others. Overcoming that hurdle and beating that disease made stepping into my dream all that much more powerful. And now I go from organization to organization and help them realize the dreams that lie beyond the obstacles that are in front of them. My name is J.V. Venable, and it was a pleasure to meet you. That's my pitch. It's my life. It's all of the things that I want to convey to you in just a short period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you've got to be able to do. It's not verbatim. It's not something that you're going to write down and you're going to get every time the same way. You're going to look at the audience in front of you. You're going to take the sights and the sounds and the inputs that you get, and then you're going to move beyond. Okay? And so with that, yes, ma'am. You've, you've got, you've got it. I said very explicitly not to mention anything negative, and I know you turned the cancer into a positive, right. but it is one of those. It's one of those areas that you've got to judge, right? It's one of those areas that you've got to judge, and this one for me is the reason why I get to, to coach companies on how they can overcome the obstacles that are in front of them. Does it make sense? So there are some exceptions to the rule, but by and large, stay away from anything negative, anything that they can perceive as something that, that, that takes the life out of you. When I talk about cancer, I talk about it in a big positive way, right? I don't talk about it as reeling back and, and, and hurting. And this is the caution that I would give all of you. 
if there's something in your pitch that makes you feel uncomfortable, it'll be legible to everybody around you. And that's why you want to take out everything that makes you uncomfortable, which is everything negative in the pitch. Does that make sense? Okay. The, at the bottom of that sheet, on the, the side that has all of the printing, you've got two things. One is you've got uh, a, a blog address. It's johnvenable.org. If you go there, there's a whole bunch of pages and more examples on elevator pitches that you can go in. There's no advertisements. There's no place where you can donate to my kid's college fund. There's nothing there, right? So go and use it and have, have a great time with it. There's a link to um, a guy who does great work here. He actually works up in the print shop upstairs in, at uh, McLean, and he can get you a 1,000 uh, of the best best business cards that you would ever want, but you need a business card. And all it needs to say is JV Venable, contact details, and that's it. It doesn't need to have flowers or anything else beyond it. Okay? I want to make it simple. So this is the mindset. It's moving away from what has hurt you into that superhero living in victory. Don't forget your cape. Don't forget to tie it around your neck, and don't forget to move forward into this life of remembering how very positive you are and how incredible you would be in any organization. It's this thought process that's key because all of us have these days when we sit back and, and life just weighs down upon us, right? And, and there's days where I can give you a really positive pitch, and then there's days when it's really hard. Ladies and gentlemen, with practice, if you sit down and you make this part of you, it will be an elevating thing to you in a way and a gift that will sing way beyond an introduction. It'll be you remembering just how, how pos positive, how incredible you are as a human being. And with practice, it won't just be a one-off. It'll come more and more to where when you walk in a room and you just think about giving your pitch, your chest puffs out, and you become that person with a superhero cape that you know you genuinely are. This is the story of you. All too often we forget how very special God made us. And all too often we forget that there is only one person who has the skill sets and the talents and the wants and the loves and the passions that you have. Remembering that is one of the greatest gifts that I can give you, and I hope you walk away tonight with just a little bit taller thought process. If nothing else, you know that that back's getting a little straighter and your chest is coming a little bit out. This is my last thought to you. A lot of you sit here in this room and you pray and I am one of the most prayerful men that you've ever met. But it doesn't just happen out of prayer. Pray as though it all depends on God because it does. And work like it all depends on you because it does. Those aren't my words. I think it's St. Augustine who said that. I think this is a cool place. I hope to see you back next week. Tonight, if you'll send me an invitation to connect, I'll connect with you. If you would do me the great honor of going on to my website, I would be more than thrilled. If you'll write a recommendation, that would be one of the greatest gifts that you can give me. But more than anything else, I want to hear you give me your pitch, and I want to see that back go back and your smile come out as you remember what an incredible gift you are to God. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time and your patience. <laughs>Thank you, John. Awesome as always. Awesome as always. You know, a true story uh, John mentioned four years ago. So uh, I still remember when John came in here and he actually had, there was someone reviewing resumes back then. Mike Hager ran the Office of Personnel Management for President Bush. So this is a really senior guy that's reviewing resumes for us back then. And John goes over there and he looks at his resume and John gives him his elevator pitch. 
uh, as only John can, and uh, still roughly the same one that we saw today. And Mike stopped reviewing his, his resume, came over and got me and said, you have to meet this guy. So uh, I'm glad he did that and that uh, four years later, he's still uh, doing great things for us. So appreciate you doing that. It's, um, you know, it's something that can be really underplayed that it's a small part of networking. But I think what you find, as you can see in John, is when you really perfect it to the point you really like it, you're actually excited about going and delivering it. So that's the difference is when you go from nervous to excited. And that doesn't, John will tell you, you know, he practices his, when he first gave it, hundreds of times. And so those of you who did it tonight, kind of reading it the first time, pretty impressive, you know, but you kind of get to a point where it's tweaked and you like it and come visit his table with the rest of his team. They work magic over there, 6.30 to 7.30, take that opportunity. So he's gonna count how many of you has come back and actually deliver that and actually get some closure with him. I certainly know I'd wanna take advantage of that because it's you get that great opening line, you wanna go deliver it. And it comes across as really sincere, you know, and, and balanced, but proud of what you have to say, it, uh, it works. So thanks and uh, more great speakers in the weeks ahead. And with that, media will close us. Let us stand to honor God. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace toward us. In the beginning, we asked that if you would hover right around and you would be with us at the end of it, we would give you praise, we would give you honor, and we would give you glory. You are as good as your promise. We thank you for sending us out of here tonight with your blessing. And so, as we promised, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory due only to your matchless name. In Jesus' name, amen.